Hi, Sec 1s. In today's lesson, we will be continuing learning about how did the British gain control over Singapore. So do take note that this is part 2 and part 1 has already been uploaded in the previous lesson. So what did we cover in the previous lesson? Mostly, we studied about how the British set up a trading settlement in Singapore with the signing of the 6 Feb 1819 Agreement. Okay, if you recall, Tunku Hussein was smuggled back in and he was proclaimed as the rightful Sultan of Johor and he signed the 6 Feb 1819 Agreement which basically stated uh, Singapore as a form of a British possession. But bear in mind that at this point of time in 6 Feb 1819, the British do not have full control over Singapore. They only have the rights to establish a trading settlement in Singapore. So what are we going to cover in today's lesson? We will be covering these three smaller objectives. Okay, number one, we are going to study about how did the Dutch and British government react to the signing of the 6 Feb 1819 agreement. Number two, what was life like in Singapore between 1819 and 1824? And last but not least, how did the British gain full control over Singapore by 1824? So from 1824 onwards, the British are in full control already. Okay, so first question. How did the Dutch government react to the signing of the 6 Feb 1819 agreement? Bear in mind that whatever I'm going through, you should be writing down on page 20 of your content package. I will not be completing the whole worksheet. I will only be focusing on the Dutch and the British. So how do you think the Dutch government reacted? Would they have been happy to Raffles establishing the 6 Feb 1819 agreement? The answer is no. They would have been extremely, extremely angry. And the reason for this is because Singapore was part of the Johor Real Sultanate ruled by Sultan Abdul Rahman, whom they recognised and placed under Dutch protection. So when Raffles decided to make Tengku Hussein become Sultan Hussein, in control of the whole of Singapore, essentially Raffles is going against the decisions and choices made by the Dutch. Secondly, Raffles' actions threatened Dutch influence over Singapore. Raffles did not ask for permission to set up a trading settlement there, and therefore the Dutch government were extremely furious with the 6 Feb 1819 agreement. What then about the British government? How do you think they would have reacted? Okay, I think most of you would think that they would have been happy, right? Okay, but no. They were also very, very angry. Bear in mind that Raffles is not equal to the British government. Raffles works for the government. So when Raffles decided to sign the 6 Feb 1819 agreement, he didn't really get full permission from the British government. And the British government was very, very angry because Raffles' actions worsened their relations with the Dutch and almost led to a war between the British government and the Dutch government. And if there really was a war, it would take a huge financial toll on the British government. Therefore, the British government were initially extremely upset with Raffles for signing the 6 Feb 1819 agreement. Okay, so this argument between the British government and the Dutch government went on for about 5-6 years. And later on, we will learn about how they resolved this particular issue over Singapore. Our next objective then is what was life like in Singapore between 1819 and 1824. Okay, I'm not going to say much. Go and watch this video. Okay, at the same time after that, do page 13 of your skills package on your Google document in your Google Classroom. Okay, after which come back to this video and press play again. Okay, I believe you would have watched the video, so you would have some idea about what Singapore was like under Raffles and Farquhar. So our third objective now is how did the British gain full control over Singapore by 1824? If you recall, I mentioned earlier, right? In 1819, they did not have full control. They were only allowed to establish a trading settlement. Full, the control over the whole of Singapore was by and large still with the Malay rulers. But something will happen in 1824 that gives the British the entire legal rights slash full control over Singapore. So watch this video and go and attempt page 21 and then you come back to this video. 
Okay, so now I'm going to go through the answers for page 21 of your content package. Okay, starting with number one, in the 1819 treaty, the 6 Feb 1819 treaty, how was the control of Singapore divided between the British and Malay rulers? The British rulers only established a small trading post in Singapore. Their access to Singapore is considered to be very, very limited. The Malay rulers, Sultan Hussein and Temenggong, the chief, by and large, still owned the rest of the island, which is a very, very huge chunk. And therefore, the Malay rulers had majority of control over Singapore. Next question. What made the British pave the way for the signing of the 1824 Treaty of Friendship and Alliance? If you recall, when Raffles first signed the 6 Feb 1819 Treaty, the British government was extremely angry, right? But by 1824, their views towards Singapore had changed and therefore they wanted full control over Singapore. So why exactly did this view change? The answer is pretty simple. The British realised that Singapore is an asset. Okay, it is significant because it is able to protect and expand British trade in China and the Malay archipelago. Always link it back to the idea of strategic location. Okay, Singapore's location has been and is still extremely valuable for whichever country or government is in charge of Singapore. So how did the deal between John Crawford and the Malay rulers benefit both parties? In other words, how did the 1824 Treaty of Friendship and Alliance benefit both parties? The British now had legal ownership over all of Singapore. Okay, so they have full control by this stage. And the Malay rulers were given monetary offers, which allowed them to maintain their followers. So when we say monetary offers, essentially we're talking about money. To the Malay rulers, being able to garner the support of the people was more important than the legal rights to the country. Okay, unfortunately, along the way, the Malay rulers will suffer quite a bit because the British will increasingly downplay the autonomy and the rights of the Malay rulers to rule the people as well. Okay, next. What occurred during the 1824 Treaty of London, also called the Anglo-Dutch Treaty? So when we say something is Anglo, right, we are referring to the British. So there's two treaties. The first treaty is the Treaty of Friendship and Alliance between the British and the Malay rulers. And the second one is the 1824 Treaty between the British government and the Dutch government. So earlier on, we mentioned that they were arguing for five or six years about what to do with Singapore, right? By 1824, they will come to an agreement slash consensus about what to do with Singapore. Okay, and this is what they decided. Southeast Asia was being carved into zones of influence. The British officially, from 1824 onwards, they had control slash influence over Singapore and the peninsula to its north. So we are talking about states like Malacca or countries like Malaysia. Okay, of course, back then it wasn't called Malaysia. And the Dutch, on the other hand, they had influence slash control over islands south of Singapore, such as Ben Kulan, okay, or more specifically, we're talking about modern day Indonesia. I will explain this idea of a sphere of influence to you in the later slide, so don't worry first. Okay, so last question. Name the two treaties that made Singapore formally under British colony. I believe I've already mentioned the answer. And that is, number one, Treaty of Friendship and Alliance between British and Malay rulers. And number two, Treaty of London slash anglo dutch Treaty between British and Dutch. So the British have been very smart. They have already consolidated power within Singapore. And they have also consolidated power amongst the other European powers and established Singapore as a specifically British colony. Earlier on, I mentioned that I'll explain to you the terms of the Anglo-Dutch Treaty a bit clearer, right? So look at this picture over here. Okay, those you see in blue is representative of before 1824. So what that means is that the Anglo-Dutch Treaty has not been signed. And what you see after 1824 is after the Anglo-Dutch Treaty has been signed. So you can see very, two very, very clear spheres of influence. Pretty much the whole of Indonesia is now owned by the Dutch. Ben Kulen, which was formerly under British control, is given away to the Dutch. Okay, And the area Singapore and up north, right? So Singapore, Malaya, they belong to the British. 
So you see, for example, Singapore used to be under the control of the Dutch. But under the Anglo-Dutch Treaty, Singapore becomes under the control of the British. So you will notice something. Look from Singapore and up above. Look at all the green ones. They now all belong to the British. Okay, and look from Indonesia below. They all belong to the Dutch. So this is how the Anglo-Dutch Treaty increasingly curved out, or rather carved out, spheres of influence in the Southeast Asian region. Okay, with that, what I want you to do is go to page 22 of your content package and attempt this quiz. In the next lesson, I will go through the answers with you. Okay, that's all for today. Bye-bye.